This whole idea of setting boundaries, it gets a little bit misunderstood. Like everybody thinks you have to set boundaries, which means keep people away. I refuse to do that. That's beyond my boundary. I'm not doing that. No, no, no. That's not what boundaries mean. What boundaries means are, let me tell you what I imagine and what my limitations are. We have boundaries in relationship. You sit down with your partner. You co-create the relationship that you want to have. You discuss what the boundaries are that you both agree to obey. I hear what the boundaries are you want. You understand the things that I need. And we come to an agreement and say, yes, those are the boundaries. I think you gotta have a dream. The school of greatness. Really? <laughs> yeah. Please welcome Lewis House. One of the things I love about you is how intelligent you are and also vulnerable you are. And I think that's a rare combination because usually people lean one way or the other, but you're really great at mixing both of them. Oh, thank you. And I wanted to ask you a question that I think has been um, an interesting conversation, specifically in the last three to six months. That includes relationships, work, AI, and leadership. Okay. There's been a lot of, in my opinion, distractions over the last few years of all the new shiny things that come out that are available for us at work, at home, and in relationships. And I'm curious, with everything that you've seen in the last few years, all the different distractions that have come out in life, where do you see intimacy and relationships personally and also professionally in the workplace as AI starts to evolve in everywhere? So let's just take one step back. <laughs> uh, the concept of AI is not new. It's an algorithm, right? Um, and our lives since the early days of the internet have been governed by algorithms. Yes. Right? What's an algorithm? Let's start there. Yeah. Right? We talk about algorithms every day. It's in our vernacular, but what is it? An algorithm is very simply um, uh, a set of instructions. Mathematical or, or computer code, it's a set of instructions. That's all it is. Right? So a, a, a recipe is an algorithm. Two eggs, cup of milk, some flour, what you get is that. And so, you know, the algorithm, the set of instructions is, you know, Lewis went on Amazon and bought this, show him that, right? That's all it is. It's a list of instructions to solve a problem or to, to, to generate some sort of uh, result. And so there's been artificial intelligence around us for a long time. You know, if you go back to the early days of, you know, uh, Ask Jeeves, which was pre-Google, right? Didn't work very well. Right. And you had to write in full sentences. And so Google um, was invented a different algorithm that worked a different way that you could put in less information and you could get the thing that you're more likely to be looking for, right? And you know, the goal was always that, that you'd find what you're looking for on the first page. Remember back in the early days, you'd sometimes have to scroll a few pages, yeah. right? So they're constantly improving these lists of instructions and tell the computer what to do with a certain input. I think the thing that's new is the generative AI, mm. right? Where um, the the machine can sort of, A, it sounds like Star Trek. You know, it's like it speaks in normal language that you don't have to, you don't have to type in Google. You know, it's a, Google is a language. You know, you type in the keywords you want. You don't have to speak in complete sentences. But now you talk to another human being and it tells you what you want. Um, but it's still based on existing information. The thing that scares me about AI is the thing that I think scares everybody about, AI, about generative AI and the, and, and the, is the speed at which this algorithm can work and the speed at which it can invent things. And but is that something to be scared about or more excited about? You both. Think? The answer is both. And I think anybody who comes on one side or the other of the equation is missing the point. You know, um, there's a cost for everything. And for all the benefits of anything in our lives, there's always a cost. You want to make a lot of money, that's your drive. You know, you want to get rich and become a millionaire. Okay, there's a cost for the money you make. You're going to sacrifice relationships. You're going to sacrifice sleep. You're going to sacrifice your health. Who knows what it is, right? But you're going to pay for that in some way, shape, or form. It's a balanced equation, right? So the more fantastic the benefits of any technology, the the balanced equation has to be considered. Interesting. So is it worth all the benefits if it's going to cost this much, right? And we're looking at climate change now and industrialization, like all the benefits of industrialization, was it worth the cost? I think some of us would have preferred to maybe scale back some of that and not deal with what we're dealing with now, right? So 
I think we have to do a cost analysis, which is, I want this, but at what cost? Are we, I want this, but at the cost of undermining a democracy? Oh, that seems like a steep cost for something to write a book for me, you know? <laughs> right, right. Like, I'm not sure. And at, and at least as it exists now, it's useless for original thoughts. So people ask me all the time, are you scared of it? I'm like, absolutely not, not scared of it at all. Because if you ask AI to write a book in the style of Simon Sinek, you know, on any subject, it can only draw from what I've already written, but it can't give them a new thought. Doesn't right? bring new perspective. Doesn't bring, it's, there's no new ideas, right? Um, it will do some things that I think are really interesting. It'll change the balance of jobs. So for example, if you work in public relations or if you're a, you know, even a script writer, whatever it is, you know, there is fear of AI, of course. Um, again, can't do general, uh, it can't do, uh, new ideas, right? but a lot of ideas are not new, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, still like an artist, repackage uh, it, yeah. but like take, take, let's take a PR company, for example, right? It takes a lot of time to write that first draft. Right. And you need a good writer to write the first draft. Um, what will happen with AI is AI can write the first draft in instantaneously. So like in my world in writing, you know, this from writing a book, the writer's the hero, the editor's like the hired help. Right. Right. That'll switch, which for, not for new ideas, but for ideas that don't require novelty. Sure. Write a press release that, sure. you know, has four bullet points has that talks gonna, about he, the benefits. Right. Yeah. The editors will become the heroes. Because the AI can write the first draft. Interesting. So I think that balance will change. Um, but to go back to your original question, you know, um, um, to go back to your original question, one of the conversations that's not happening about any of this, we're not talking at all about social ripples. And there are always social ripples, right? Um, and there's a and there's a blindness. People are blind when it comes to how we talk about new things, right? And and when I talk about social ripples, what I mean is fear, right? Fear is an emotion. It is sometimes irrational, not always, sometimes irrational. And it can produce behaviors that can be antisocial. If you're afraid enough, you can hurt someone, right? You can hurt them with your words. You can hurt them with your actions based on fear, right? We've all said things in relationships out of fear, right? So let's take an analogy. Um, a bunch of do-gooders come into a town in Ohio, coal town, and say, we're getting rid of this coal mine. It's bad for the environment. We're going to replace it with solar and wind. And it's the right thing to do. And they're always surprised when the town of coal miners is angrily against it. Right. Now, the reality is they're not anti-wind, nor are they anti-solar. All I know is I'm a coal miner. My father was a coal miner. My father's father was a coal miner. All I know is how to do coal mining. And all I know is, is this mine down the street produces income for me to take care of my family. And you're coming in here and say, we're going to take your income away. Right. We're not getting rid of coal. I'm taking rid of your livelihood and you have no discernible skill set. What you get is fear. And when somebody doesn't feel seen or heard and they feel afraid that you're coming in to take something away from them, they're going to put up a wall and say, you cannot do that. Right. That's the same thing going on here, which is, um, um, all the discussion is all the job that's going to take away all the things it's going to destroy, right? And so what it's producing is fear. And when you have fear, you have um, emotional reactions that have nothing to do with computers, nothing to do with algorithms, nothing to do with generative AI. What it has to do with, um, at the minimum, is how I vote. But worse, it can get people so afraid that they start lashing out in antisocial ways, sometimes as individuals and sometimes as, as groups. Right? And we are not talking about the social ripples. We're also living in a world where the haves and the have-nots, um, the richest people and your frontline worker, the disparity is so great, right? Um, the average, so if you go back, I think 50 years or so, 40 years or so, um, on average, a CEO made about 35 times what the lowest paid worker. And now you're talking 400, 500, 600, 700 times, 800 times lowest paid workers, right? The disparity is so great. 1% of the population owns 80% of the stock, you know? I mean, it's just, it's, it's so great. And when you have huge gaps between the wealthy and those who work to make the wealthy wealthy, um, um, 
that is a recipe for rebellion. So we already are living in a tinderbox right now where this is what is this is normal, right? And it's it's and it, we've seen the rise of this populist message. I don't care if you're a Republican and Democrat. We heard it from Trump. We heard it from Bernie Sanders, right? They're pointing out the disparity, and um, and the liberals loved Bernie and the conservatives loved Trump, right? Because they're saying, look what look what look what's happening, um, and unfortunately, in both cases, are leveraging fear for a vote. Um, but we're not talking about um, the fear that the discussion of AI is producing. And the very, the the reactions that can have that has nothing to do with the computer. Really, we're not talking about that. What are the, what are the f- fear conversations that you're hearing from people, um, and what are the emotions that are coming out of it at the early stages, and where do you think that's good ahead over the next few years? Um, nobody's listening. You know, again, it goes back to that coal miner example, right? Well-intentioned people can come in and say, um. Um, this is something that's important for the environment, but we understand that this is highly disruptive to your life. We're not going to take anything away, but let's, I want to hear how you feel. Mm. They're, they're not, they're not asking those questions. They're not asking questions. They're not trying to understand the fear. They're not making people feel seen or heard or understood. They're just coming in, you know, they're barreling in. And by the way, this is both sides of the political aisle. Both sides of the political aisle are barreling in with their, their, their desires without listening to the people who it's going to affect. Right, and then they're surprised that people are angry and put up a, a roadblock. Um, uh, and so, it, to answer your question, it's not happening. Those conversations aren't happening. There is a total lack of listening in our nation. There's a total lack of empathy in our nation. You know, we're we're now living in a world of you're right and I, uh, I'm right and you're wrong, rather than than we have a problem and we should be you and me against the problem rather than me against you. Which is like a healthy, conscious, intimate relationship, but they teach you in therapy. Correct. And, and, and you'll find a lot of overlaps in the stuff that we're going to talk about if you want to talk mass population. <laughs> yes. And uh, intimate relationships. It's, Interesting. It, it's, the, it's, it's human beings talking to human beings. Do you think that we will ever, as a nation, at least in this country, be able to say, hey, how do we come together and focus on the problem, not you're right and you're wrong? Or do you think it's politics create so much of a division that people just, there'll be too much fear for people to actually listen to both sides. I'm not even talking about politics, but just about AI or relationships or business or wealth or whatever it might be. Do you think we'll ever be able to do that? Do you know when people come together and put all their political differences aside? War? Correct. That's kind of scary though. When, when we are challenged by an external existential threat, oh, man. we come together, right? We saw what happened after September 11th. We saw, you know, uh, Osama bin Laden believed that by flying planes into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, that it would fracture America. It did the absolute opposite. Wow. Right? Because there's one thing greater than my fear of you is the fear of that. And we saw it during the first rendition of the Cold War. The fear of the Soviet Union and the nuclear war at the Soviet Union, um, uh, even though there was politics and there's territoriality and the armed forces and all of the nonsense that still exists today, at the end of the day, we could all agree on one thing, that's worse. So I, I can put, we can put our differences aside because that's worse. And so the mistake that America made when the Berlin Wall came down and the Soviet Union collapsed um, is we falsely believed that we had won the war. And there's no such thing as winning global politics. It's like the Roman Empire doesn't exist, but the, the physical land still exists and the people who were Romans are now Italians. It's like nobody went away. They just changed forms. It's like the law of conservation of matter, law of conservation of energy, and there's a law of conservation of people. Right. Right? People don't just disappear because the empire is gone. The empire is a, is a, is a political construction. And so we didn't win anything. The Soviet Union collapsed, but the people is still there and the culture is still there and the land is still there. Um, uh, um, and America acted like victors. Um, and uh, what always happens in an infinite game, what always happens in a game that has no end, is new players will emerge. It's like when one company goes bankrupt, it doesn't mean the game of business is over, it means new companies will fill the space. Well, new nations fill the space. And so the, the, uh, the threats that challenged America showed up in the form of North Korea, in the form of uh, global terrorism, you know, Al-Qaeda and ISIS and all other uh, 
spinoffs. Um, and I think that global competition is actually a very good thing. It's scary. It creates tension. Um, but the irony is, is we as capitalists, because America believes in capitalism and, and democracy, we as capitalists believe that competition is ultimately good for the consumer and we have laws against monopolies. Well, America for 30 years was acting like a monopoly, like the cable company. Everybody hated you. You had no choice, <laughs> right? you know, and you can impose your will on the consumer willy nilly, which America imposed its will on the world willy nilly with no reaction. And so I actually think the rise of a, of a, of a, a balance of power, a, a, a competition, um, is probably the best thing that can happen to America. It doesn't have to lead. It doesn't have to be war. Uh, it doesn't have to be war, but it does have to be, um, uh, uh, somebody who offers a legitimate challenge to the power structure. Why do you think in our personal lives, it takes a near death experience to us or someone around us, a big health scare, a divorce, a breakup, or a massive breakdown in, in career or something for us to see a new path and start improving who we are, becoming better, transforming, overcoming this breakdown. And why does it sound like it takes war or conflict or something extremely scary out there for us to come together and start to transform as well as people? You know, we're, we're a myopic bunch, you know, uh, human beings are very dopamine driven, you know, find the food, look for shelter, you know, um, then do it again. And long-term planning is not really our strength as a species. Uh, because long-term planning exists in our imaginations. I better save money for the day that I retire 60 years from now. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, it's just like, well, or I could just buy now because <laughs> it feels better, right? We're just, we're bad at it. We're bad as governments at it. We're bad as individuals at it. We're just bad at it. <laughs> we're not engineered for it. Um, and so I think, I think uh, that's a part of it. Um, and what near death experiences do or, um, competitive threats do is they're tangible reminders of what could be. Cause we're, again, we're tangibly driven animals, right? We love tangibility metrics, things we can see, you know, you hear a bump in the night, you have to go look for it, you know? Um, and so, uh, it makes it real. Um, so even though global threats have existed since the fall of the Soviet Union, now that you can see one, you know? Now you can give it a name and a flag, you know, and a language. It becomes a real thing. And I think the same goes for um, new death experiences. It's like my mortality, which was something that I didn't think about, is now real, which is why I ask, ask old people for advice. They give the best advice because yeah. they don't give it what you think about them. <laughs> because they're close because they've accepted the, their own mortality. The end is near. The end is near. And so I'm not doing anything to please you anymore. Yeah, I'm not trying to impress you. Uh, you know, talk to a 20 year old and talk to a 70 year old and see what kind of advice you get. Um, and it's not just experience and wisdom. Of course, that factors in as well. You know, one is much more concerned about what you think about them. The other one really doesn't uh, care. Um, uh, so I think I think that's what these these shocks do. And I think one of the things that storytelling does, one of the things that you do and I do and others do, is by telling the stories of other people's near-death experiences or other people's um, uh, losses, um, hopefully, hopefully inspires people to take on themselves without having to go through the challenge themselves. Um, um, that's the ideal. But you know, I remember after September 11th, I, I was in New York on September 11th and lived through it. You were there. Yeah. I watched the buildings fall. Really? Yeah, yeah. Where? What part of the? Uh... I was downtown. I was in Soho. Really? So just about. A, I was. A, I actually did the calculations. I figured out I was exactly one mile. You could see the buildings from my office. Yeah, I watched. I was. I was walking. I took the subway, and the subway stopped at Fourteenth Street, and I still had to get to Soho. So I walked down Seventh Avenue, um, which the end of Seventh Avenue was the World Trade Center. Wow! And so I was walking down, watching them burning. And, Holy cow! And then got to work. Uh, and the view from my office was the World Trade Center. No way. And yeah, I remember. I remember the very strange. Yeah, that's in that's that's in Boston, my brain. I'm not going to that, forget that image of it. Well, oh, what oh, was that? Oh. I mean, this is a little sidetrack here, but what was that ex that day like? I mean, watching it at your office. 
What was the scene like? Were people paying attention? Was ever all eyes on the yeah, building? Yeah, of course, of course, of course. Wow. Um, we were, you know, at this point, we when, when I woke up in the morning, because the first plane hit shortly after 8 a.m. and I hadn't left the house yet. And, Had you already heard about it? Well, it was on the news. A friend of mine okay. called me to turn on the news. So I turned on the news and there was a hole in the World Trade Center and it was burning. But the scale of those buildings is so huge that we couldn't tell that it was an airliner. We thought it was a Cessna. So you saw a hole in the building. The buildings were so big. You literally just thought it was an... And it was a beautiful day. So it's not like there was a storm. It was a perfect day. So we just thought it was an idiot in a Cessna. And I went to work. And people started to talk about it on the bus. On, I was taking the cross town bus. Like, you know, did you see what happened? And by the time I got off the subway on 14th Street, because, you know, media disappears under the ground. Uh, now there were people sitting on the sides of the street listening to radios in their cars. And at this point now, we started to realize this was terrorism. So it, it, it was, we started to recognize what it was pretty quickly, but we didn't know what the implications were. And we also didn't expect the buildings to fall down. You know, it was a weird flaw in how the buildings were made that made them, because, you know, most buildings had internal load-bearing structures. And what made the World Trade Center unique was all the load-bearing structures were on the outside. And so the floor is basically floated in the middle. Wow. So except for the, escal uh, except for the elevators, the, well, you could stand on one side of the World Trade Center inside and look clear over to the side of the building. You know, it was, it was an amazing building. Wow. And so they, they collapsed on top of each other when it came down, which nobody knew would happen. Um, and so um, I was in constant contact with my sister who worked also in Soho across town. Wow. And we were talking constantly. And after the second building fell, I called her up and said, I'm coming to get you. We're going to go home. And we lived uptown. And so I walked across town to get her. And uh, we were part of the mass exodus walking four miles uptown. And um, of all the thousands of Im images that were captured that day, um, one image I, and I went through all the books and everything, you know, I, I, uh, one image that was really never captured was this, it was very quiet. We were all walking in one direction, just imagine thousands of people, no cars on the road, walking north. No one in the subway. No. Yeah, everyone's just like... Everybody's above ground and we're all going, it was very quiet and speckled in between all of this exodus where people covered head to toe in soot. Wow. But other than that, everything was normal. They were holding their briefcase and their newspaper and it was just covered in, in debris. They were covered. I mean, we saw the pictures of people covered, but they were just speckled. And my sister, she had two colleagues, which we dropped them off on the way. And I remember there was all four of us and we were coming up Park Avenue and there's a guy sitting on a stoop frantically calling somebody, I guess, to tell them that, that he was alive, frantically calling. And we walked up to him and we said, give us the number. No words were spoken. We just, I remember we just walked up and said, give us the number, we'll help call. And he held up his address book. He just pointed, he didn't have words. We all typed in the number into our phones and we're hitting, you know, send, 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 send. Every single one of us was trying to call. We were all getting busy signals. My sister's phone got through. She hands him the phone. He takes it and he says, I'm okay, I'm okay. And gives the phone back and walks away. And we're all crying, obviously. Um, we dropped off two of my sister's friends, her colleagues, and it was just my sister and me walking up the rest of the way. And we got to uh, uh, Grand Central Station, which blocks Park Avenue. So you have to go around it. And as we got there, somebody started screaming, run, run, run. And we saw the cops, because there were fighter jets flying over. So you heard planes, but you didn't know what they were. So you heard planes flying over. And, and we looked down uh, the street, and the cops were going like this. And everybody started running and like dropping things and shoes falling off. They thought another plane had hit. We didn't know what it was. So I grabbed my sister and I like, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, there's going to be a blast. It's going to come down like this. And I pulled her off the street and like put our hands, you know, like, like up against the building. And I look up and it's a huge glass, you know, it's a, it's a shop window. And I'm like, this is not going to be good. So I grab her and we just start running. And then eventually just sort of petered out. It was a bomb scare. It turned out later. And then we made our way to the rest of the, we made our way back up town and didn't leave for, you know, two weeks, you know, we just, like everybody just started watching 
television obsessive. Nonstop. Yeah. yeah. Holy cow. Did you guys, did you go back to work or did you, was it like work was done for weeks? Work was done for weeks. And when it opened up, like nobody really wanted to go. And my, I, my office was in part of the town, in part of the New York that was shut down. Like you couldn't, they couldn't, get, you, there. You couldn't get there. Holy like cow. They wouldn't, they wouldn't let you down there. How did that moment of being there, ground zero, really shape you emotionally after that, after experiencing it in person? You know, I was in, I was a freshman in college when I saw it on TV and it was like, it was a big deal in Minnesota when I was in college there. It was like, you know, the whole city came together. It was the whole thing, but you were there. How did that shape you emotionally? Well, my story is one of literally, you know, a couple million. I mean, there was a lot of people in New York that day. Um, um, and they're all pretty unique stories, but they're all deeply touching and deeply personal for all of us. I mean, you said it. I mean, it reminds you of humanity and it reminds you, you know, and I remember that was, it was September 11th was very important to me in my career because I worked in advertising. And I, I struggled to go back to that stupid job in that stupid industry. Really? Yeah. I really, once I did go back to work, I'm like, what am I doing with my life? Like, it's like you, you and a lot of people signed up for the military because they're like, I got to do something with my life. And I think a lot of people had the realization that the life that I live is stupid and I want to do something that matters. And that's when I started thinking this, this is the stupidest industry in the world. Like I come to work to help people sell they don't need, like what the f- I'm doing with my life? And uh, my entrepreneurial venture started pretty shortly after that, so I could do things my way. Yeah, interesting, and do things with purpose, and started talking about things in, yeah. in, a, in a in a very different way. So yeah, it was pretty formative. I mean, and it took, unfortunately, a big breakdown to happen for you to start seeing. Maybe you had already noticed it, but that was the, really the the eye opening. Like, okay, I've got to make a change. But go back to your original question, you know, which is why does it require these things? I think, it, I think that's not interesting to me. I mean, I think that's sort of like, I get it. Uh-huh. I think what is interesting to me is why does it go back? Right? Like what why, do you mean? When you have that life-changing experience and then you, you like- You don't make a, a change. You do, no, no, you do make a change, but then it runs out. So I saw this happen after, after September 11th in New York for, for quite, a, quite a long time, I would say months. Uh, New York was utopia. There was no crime. And then, Everyone came together. Everyone came together. There was literally no crime. Everyone loved each other. Yeah. Strangers. What do you need? I'm here for There's you. There's nothing. And like the total number of racially motivated crimes in New York after September 11th was zero. So nobody like took their anger out on, you know, an Arab population, for example, it just didn't, just didn't happen. And, um, and I remember thinking to myself, this is going to go away. Like we're going to forget and we're just going to go back to being New York again. Wow. And sure enough, in enough time, we got distracted by the short term. So this, COVID was no different. In the middle of COVID, we're all thinking, oh my God, you know, I have to reevaluate my life, my work-life balance. You know, I don't want to work like a crazy person like I used to anymore. Productivity is not going to be my, my primary, you know, metric of whether I'm having a good day or not. And that went away, you know, we're all working like idiots again. And like productivity is like, people look down on you now if you're not having a productive day. Like mm. we forget. And... Again, it's this is the biology of the dopamine-driven animal that is more driven by the short term and the visual. Um, that to me upsets me more. Mm. It's not that it, not that the con- that you need some sort of shock to convert, but that the conversion doesn't last. Right. And so, you know, you you, you sort of you were joking about my orange watch, and uh, you know, I I use symbols to remind me, and so I'm. I'm surrounded. I'm like with an orange belt and like, mm. you know, I, I, I keep things around me to remind me that these things matter. And I tell the stories and you know, I tell the story of going to Afghanistan with the air force. I tell the story of, you know, my experience at center element that it's not, it's in part to remind others, but it's also in part to remind me, Yeah, you know, my sister suffered a, a horrible tragedy many years ago where she lost her fiance. He was killed right in front of her two weeks before oh my, her wedding. Oh my goodness. And during COVID, she came to me and said, I think I want to talk about my experience on the podcast because I know a lot of people are losing loved ones and perhaps my experience can help them. And, you know, again, it's in part for others, but reliving that, that horrible day with her uh, is a reminder to us as well that our relationship matters and our friends matter and our lives matter and long-term matters and, you know, and, and productivity is not the primary metric of a good day. Um, and the ability to 
I think, you know, it talked about the 20 year old versus the 70 year old, you know, it's the ability to shut out the noise, the peer pressure that judges you based on how much have you accomplished? How much money have you made? How many promotions have you had? What's your salary? You know, like we're judging our self-worth based on what other people pay us. And sure, everybody wants to make more money. I got it. You know, um, what should we judge our self-worth on? The life that we live. Um, I think I, we should judge our self-worth on the value we have in the lives of others. Do other people think of you as a good friend, a good sibling, a good son or daughter, you know, a good father, a good mother, a good colleague, a good teammate, you know? I think that I would rather be, I would rather judge myself uh, on that. And again, we're dopamine, tangible, driven animals, and it's much easier to judge myself based on number in a bank account because I can see it and I can count it. And if there's a lot in there, it must be valuable. And if there's little in there, that must be unvaluable, which is nonsense. Because I can tell you, I know a lot of rich people who have no value in the world. Um, um, and rich people aren't necessarily the hardest working. I know a lot of very rich people who are lazy. Um, and I don't criticize them for that. Just don't think that because someone's rich that they're incredibly hardworking. Um, and pe please stop calling the homeless lazy. You go be homeless for a day. See how lazy you have to be. You know, to survive with no money, no resources. Good luck. It just, the laziness isn't, that's not it. Like, you actually have to work hard at surviving when you have nothing. And I think we have all of these metrics screwed up, and they're all based on what I can count and what I can see, rather than the value I have in the lives of others. And by the way, you don't even get to judge that. Because the only way you know you have value in the lives of others is if others say you have value in their lives. Right. So that's a thing, right? Um, I'm curious about your your sister's story. That that's it. that's really heartbreaking, but also fascinating. That she wanted to say, "Hey, maybe I can help other people through my own tragedy, through my heartbreak, through my loss." And the person she is. What was that? What was the lesson that you learned from you not going through it yourself, but witnessing someone that you loved go through a loss like that? What was the lesson for you? Um, you know, I'm, there's a civil, I talk about balance all the time. There's a silver lining in every cloud. There's a cost for everything we gain in life. But at the same time, there's goodness that comes out of every loss. Um, my sister and I were already pretty close. I mean, it made us even closer. My family and I were, my family and us were also already pretty close. We got even closer. I think tragedy brings families together in a way that nothing else can. Um, perspective. This, you know, the, the stupid stuff that we got stressed about just isn't that important. You know? Um, there's something called post-traumatic growth. We love talking about post-traumatic stress, but there's also post-traumatic growth. Um, you know, there's a lot of growth that comes out of loss and tragedy as well. Um, um, I think, yeah, I, I think these things, I mean, you said it right at the top, right? It's the fragility of, uh, of why do we need these reminders? So I think that was a big one. And, yeah. and, uh, you know, my, my sister's happily married, she's got two kids, you know, and built a new life and that's super inspiring. That's right. That, that, you know, people go through breakups or divorces and they think that's it, their life is over, they'll never find love again. I'm like, we're well, here to tell you. She you, created it. Yeah. You, you, you can find love again, wow. you know? And she has a picture of, of her fiance that she lost in, in her office on her desk. And it's like, I see it there and it's a nice reminder for all of us, you know? Um, his loss is, is a nice reminder to all of us that live, live, live life, love life. Um, easier said than done. I mean, you know, you and I write books about this stuff and it's hard. It is hard work. And I get a kick out of that, by the way. You know, it's very easy to be a cat. Cats don't think about being cats. They're just cats, <laughs> right? But you have to be, you have to actually work really hard to be a human being. Oh, like, like being a good human being actually requires so much work. Yes. You know, and there's, there's, that's funny to me, you know, like to be the best version of a human being is actually very difficult and requires studying and effort and it risk does. and discomfort and all those things that, 
you know, I think this young generation is tries to avoid. Yeah. Not the work part, the discomfort part. Yeah. You mentioned about, um, you know, we shouldn't be, I can't remember exactly what you said, but we shouldn't be focusing on our, a good day being on how productive we are. Yeah. We should have a different metric yeah. of what a good day is. How do we measure what a good day is then if it's not a productive day? So this is the problem with things that are hard to measure. It doesn't mean they don't exist. It just means they're hard to measure. You know, um, you're in love with your girlfriend, uh, you know, show me the metric, show me the number that proves to me, you know, that, that she is the love of your life. Well, you can't, you can show me a bunch of behaviors and I can ask her if she feels secure, if she feels safe, if she feels seen and heard, if she feels she can be her best self because of the space you provide her, but I got no number. Um, so just cause you can't measure something or just because something's difficult to measure doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Right. So that's, that's an important lesson. I learned that in my career too. So I, I had this meeting at the Pentagon. I was sitting in the foyer waiting for the general to come in for him when he was ready to see me. And we've all had this experience where you're waiting in a foyer, waiting in a waiting area and somebody will come and get you and they take you to the conference room or the office. And because a qu being quiet is uncomfortable. We fill the dead air. Yeah. How's your day? Exactly. What's going on? Exactly. Or... Exactly. How was your flight? It's so hot out hot, here. It's so yeah. hot out. Exactly. <laughs> exactly right. It's hallway talk. <laughs> it's all it is is designed to 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 fill dead air. That's it. And the minute you walk in the office, it just stops. Nobody actually cared. Right. Right. Well, that's what happened to me. The general came to get me. We start walking to his office, and the hallway talk begins. And he says, "You know, Simon, I had everybody in my office read your book." And I said, my publisher thanks you. And he said, uh, tell them not to bother. I had them read my copy. Total book sales, one. <laughs> Total impact, huge. Mm. Compared to, I go to an event and they give away 500 free copies of the book. Total book sales, 500. But they use them as doorstops and coasters. Total yeah. impact, zero. Maybe three or four people read it, right? Right. Like, yeah. So it was that experience that I realized that I can't measure impact simply based on book sales or dollars or income or anything like that. Now, over the long term, I think you can, you know, the book is sustainable, but in the short term, it's really a useless metric. So I had to get comfortable with the fact that I was doing things that I couldn't measure the impact, but I knew had an impact. And you've heard me talk about these things before. You know, I talk about exercise where you go to the gym and you come home and you don't see anything and you go to the gym the next day and you come home and you don't see anything. And so you're like, it's not working and you're in pain. Right. <laughs> and you want to eat a cheeseburger, right. and pizza and ice cream. Yeah. And you keep doing it and you still don't really see anything until you maybe look down and read a scale or, and sometimes that's weight isn't even the thing you're replacing fat with muscle. Your weight might go up. Right. Until people start saying to you, you look really good. You look young. But you never saw it happen. It's like you never see yourself get older until you look at a picture of you from when you were younger. Right. Um, and, and so you believe we, you know, we know from the science and we know from experience that if I exercise, it's a process and it's good for me, even though I can't measure it in the short term. And if I eat well and I keep doing that, I know it'll keep me healthy for the long term. I'll eat more leafy greens and less sugar. I know I just have to stick to this process that a hundred percent, a hundred percent of the time it works. How long does it take to get into shape if you start exercising? Nobody knows. Right. Neither does any doctor. Sometimes a little less time for some people and sometimes a little more time for others. Like we don't know. We just know hundred percent that it works. And so I had to get used to the idea professionally that I'm going to do things that I know work, but I won't be able to measure them. And I just have to be okay with the fact that it works like exercise, like eating right. And so that's where, you know, learning an infant mindset and letting go of annual goals. So people are like, you know, what's your annual goal? I don't have any because I can't predict what I'm going to achieve based on arbitrary timelines. So I have guidelines, you know, like I run a marathon. I like to know the speed I'm going at. Like I do look at numbers. They matter to me. They help me measure speed and distance, but I don't get happy or sad if I hit or miss a number. Why do you think so many people get sad or happy based on if they, they hit their goals and sometimes because you hit their goals and you're still not happy because we're dopamine driven short-term visual animals i mean it's going to go in a circle right um and because we can create if you create a goal 
and you hit it, you get a shot of dopamine. That is what happened, right? Any kind of beginning, middle, and end, if you reach the end, you'll get the dopamine. Like, find food, found it. Oh, it feels good. I lost my keys, found them. Oh my God, it feels so good, right? Um, this is why we often confuse um, on a first date. We do this, like falling in love on the first, you know, on the first date. Not really true. That's not oxytocin and serotonin. That's actually dopamine because you, you think you found the thing you're looking for. So you have a list of things in your head that you want in your relationship. This person seems to have a bunch of them and you have, you know, new relationship energy. All you see is the stuff that you want that's on your the perfect on stuff, your list, yeah, the perfect yeah. stuff. And you're literally like, I, I think this is the found one. It. Yeah. I think, I think they're the one. I'm like, congratulations. You are getting, you're flooding with dopamine on date one right, or date two. And you are not in love. We've all made the mistake. You are not in love. I've made it too many times. Of course. Yeah. Go out a bunch more. Go, go out a bunch more. You realize what the hell was I thinking? Right. right. And they've said that about me. Um, uh, we can't help ourselves. And I think that if you recognize these things, um, and 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 I, and you and let's go right back to the question where you started, which is you talked about the condition of the human relationship, right? Um. And I think when the human relationship declines, when our feelings of love and friendship and closeness and deep, meaningful relationships decline, we become more obsessed with the external validations, the clicks, the likes, the followers, you know, um, to the point where it's literally become a career. Um, I'm an influencer, which means I have more clicks than you, more likes than you more followers than you and that makes me an alpha in our society you know i went to an event recently and there was this uh this pretty girl who was i was sitting in my seat at this event and she was posing for pictures as her friend took pictures of her and somebody leans over to me she goes she's a very famous influencer and i said you mean she's a freelance employee of an algorithm because that's what an influencer is. They're freelance employees for algorithms. They might make a lot of money. A lot of, some freelancers make a lot of money and they work for the algorithm. The algorithm is their boss. They have to feed the algorithm. Or they have to feed the algorithm. If the algorithm changes, it could destroy their whole income and you never get to rest. You never get to rest because the algorithm doesn't rest. You don't get to rest. And it could influence their self-worth. So the, the, the smart influencers, if they're making coin, right? Bank that coin, invest that coin because you are going to burn out or the algorithm will change, or somebody else will do it better than you. More likely, you're going to burn out. Yes, nobody can maintain that pace of recording your life every moment, you know, for content, 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 because the algorithm never rests. Think of it like CNN. It's a 24 hour new, 24 hour news cycle for your life. Crazy, right? And we saw what happened to the quality of news when we went to a 24 hour news cycle. 24 hour news cycle, right? Now think of some of the quality of life when you go to a 24 hour content production schedule. Um, your vacations, you have to bring your camera with you. You're always on. You're always on. Your relationships, you bring your camera with you. You're going to burn out. Um, and uh, if you've been saving your money and investing your money, you'll be just fine. But if you're spending that money, it's not going to be good. How does someone manage their own life's motivation while making sure they're being somewhat productive to have a career that pays them an income and can cultivate growth within a career or their own business while also creating the metric of a good day. How can we balance those three of staying motivated, not being lazy, having a balanced, healthy, beautiful day while also being productive? What's wrong with being lazy? Nothing what wrong is, with What it. does lazy mean? What does it, what is it, what does it mean to be lazy? I think well, my, I think my definition of what I'm being thinking about right now is more of like not caring about anything is, it would be my definition of lazy, like not caring. Caring. Okay. That's, so th but I've maybe not, I think, but I think it's clear we, that we use that Yes. because lazy to some people might be sitting on a couch watching TV all day. Uh -huh. Right now, if I've been working with a crazy person, that's that, relaxing. That, that sounds, that good sounds, that sounds good to me. Or maybe I'm watching documentaries and I'm generating ideas. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's not so, lazy to me. To somebody, you know, that I haven't produced something at the end of the day, that's tangible because this being things being produced all the time here, right? Ideas. Um, then 
So I, let's be clear that what we mean by is not lazy. What we mean by is is how do you how do you live a life where you care? Like yes. people who don't care. So I think I think older generations, and I count myself amongst them, our generation is pretty judgy because we believe you go to work, you get the promotion, you move you move your way up the ladder, and we kind of understand people who don't have ambition. Right. It's like, what do you mean you What do you mean you're not interested in like moving up the ladder and getting more responsibility and one day achieving a leadership right. position. Or they feel entitled to just be a leader right. at 24 right. you without work putting the work. Right. Yeah. Like we're, but we're pretty judgy, right? And I think we have to recognize that raw ambition is fine for some. And some people want to just come to work, get a paycheck, and have that paycheck pay for their lifestyle. And they're not interested in moving up the ladder. They're interested in fair compensation. They... It's not that they don't care. They do care. They still do good work. They're just not career-minded. They, they're lifestyle-minded. Mm -hmm. And so um, we can't judge them as unproductive and lazy just because they don't have any aspirations to move up through the ladder. Um, but they can't uh, get all... If they haven't been giving like massive raises when they're just, you know, like managing... And I know a lot of people who are very happy. They make a decent living... They spend their money and they go on vacations and they save enough and it's all balanced. And it's, I think they live fantastic lives. Great. They care. Yeah. They care about the work and they care about the quality of their work. They care about their lives and the quality of their lives. And they, and, and they, and they want the two to coexist. Right. Um, but remember we said cost, there's a cost for everything. So if you want to be highly, highly ambitious and make all that money and get all that charm, that comes at a cost to your personal life. If all you want is go on vacations, well, that came as a cost sometimes to your income or or your professional stability, right? So the goal is to find the balance that you're comfortable with. You know, some may tilt a little more towards ambition and some may tilt a little more towards lifestyle. And it's not for us to judge, it's for us to understand. And if I can understand that's how somebody on my team wants to live a life, then then I'm okay with that. And I'll, then as long as they do good work and they care, I think that's a very good and important, as long as they care, um, I'm not going to overload them with stuff that they can prove to me that they can do it, but I want them to do good work with, within within those boundaries. Yes. And I'm cool with it. But and when we talk about, like, I think this whole idea of setting boundaries, you know, it gets a little bit um, misunderstood, uh -huh. right? Like everybody thinks you have to set boundaries, which means keep people away. I refuse to do that. That's beyond my boundary. I'm not doing that. No, no, no. That's not what boundaries mean. What boundaries means are, let me tell you what I imagine and what my limitations are. We have boundaries in relationships, right? You sit down with your partner, you co-create the relationship that you want to have, and if you're a good relationship, you discuss what the boundaries are that you both agree to obey. And it's not for us to judge the boundaries of other relationships based on the boundaries of our relationships, and vice versa, right? We create the boundaries that make us comfortable, and we agree to stay within those boundaries. We can do whatever we want inside those boundaries, but we cannot step outside those boundaries. Whatever relationship style you want to have, you got to have boundaries. And that is a discussion. And I think that is the right thing to do in a professional circumstance as well. It was always assumed that there's only one kind of boundary, right? which is the one I have. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> and if you got to work till 10 o'clock at night and work on a Saturday, you do it. Make it happen. Right? Yeah. But that's not the reality of a young generation anymore, but we're not having the discussion. What, we, what we've what we confused is boundaries as a conversation versus boundaries as a um, unilateral wall that yes. says, I'm not doing that, and you can't ask me to do that. Right. It should be a conversation, which is somebody says, look, I'm not interested in moving up the ranks. I want to be treated fairly. I want to be paid fairly. I'm going to do good work, but I don't want to work late at night, and I don't want to work on weekends because I want to live a lifestyle. And I'll say, okay, like an early relationship, let's have a negotiation, right? Which is, I'm cool with that. Every now and then, every now and then, when, when there's a lot of stress and things have gone haywire or we have a huge deadline, I may need you to stay late a couple nights or the occasional Saturday, but I'll give you Monday off. I'll make it up to you. I'm not going to take away from you without giving you back. And I won't do it a lot. I won't abuse it. But every now and then, yeah. are you okay with that boundary? The flexible boundary, yes. Right? So yeah. I hear what the boundaries are you want. You understand the things that I need. 
and we come to an agreement and say, yes, those are the boundaries. We, we're, we're both, we're, we're all cool with that. We're in alignment. Yes. We're in alignment. And that becomes more productive, but that's not what's happening. Usually the discussion of boundaries is me telling you as opposed to, and by the way, try that in your relationship. <laughs> not going to go well. <laughs> me telling you what my boundaries are in my relationship as opposed to a discussion where I can understand where the boundaries are coming from and maybe your past experiences or maybe you've had bosses that took advantage of you or maybe you were underpaid and somebody uh, 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 abused the fact that you were, you know, salary or, or whatever it is. It's just a conversation because we don't know what somebody's previous experience is that makes them create the boundary that they have now. And they're usually based on some sort of preventing something from happening again. Right, that already happened in the past. Yeah, right? Yeah. It, it happened to me. I'm never letting that happen to me again. Bingo. It's my boundary. Yeah, yeah. Right? Like everything, this is going to be a circular conversation for us. <laughs> it's human beings interacting with human beings. Yeah. And like, we we have to, we have to do this together. Like, the relationship is ours. My girlfriend and I uh, joke that, you know, when we first showed up in our relationship, you know, I wanted her to fit the blueprint that I expected of her, what I expected of a girlfriend. Which was? I mean, we all have our own yeah, blueprint. Yeah, your own definition of it. We yes. all have our own blueprints of what, what we want. Right, right. And she wanted me to fit the blueprint of what- Her definition. Of her definition of what a boyfriend should be and what the real, and what my, what my definition of a relationship should look like. And we were both failing miserably to live up to each other's blueprint. Really? Of course. Were you How failing? Can I? Were you failing after it was discussed? Here's what there I- There was no discussion. Everybody oh. shows up with a blueprint in their head and I, you don't, I, you either fit it or you don't. Right. Okay. So that's where the conflict started. Of course. And then you, they're constantly letting you down or you're picking fights or whatever it is. It didn't go very well until we sat down and be like, this is not working. And so we agreed that I have to throw out my blueprint and you have to throw out your blueprint. We like each other a lot. So we know that. So it's a good basis. We respect each other. We care about each other. We have the same values. Why don't we agree to write a new blueprint together? And co-creation became our mantra. That's beautiful. Right? That the relationship will not be mine and it will not be yours. It'll be ours. And I can no longer make a unilateral decision about what I want in this relationship because the relationship doesn't belong to me. It belongs to us. We have joint custody of this relationship. Interesting. Right? And by the way, you can't make unilateral decisions about what happens in this relationship because it doesn't belong to you. I got 50% of this. <laughs> right. Right? And the result has been amazing and it requires lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of communication and boundary setting and yes. discussions. And I think professional relationships should be the same, which is I have a blueprint in my head of what an employee should do. An employee has a blueprint in their head of what a company or a boss should do. Uh -huh. And the problem is, is hopefully that goes well. Sometimes it goes well and sometimes it completely falls apart versus saying, I got this job. You got this, you know, you're, you got this, you're my boss. Can we have a discussion about what we want this relationship to be. I'm not going to get everything I want and you're not getting everything you want. It's not because that's the boundary. Like I declare, right. That's just not going to work. Right. Um, but can we, and this is why I think it's important for companies to talk about their why and their values. I think it's important for companies to set expectations, what it's like to work here. And don't give me this work hard, play hard. Bull like any company that tells you we work hard, play hard, please run in the opposite direction. Right. Why not? Work smart, play always, right? Because working hard sounds unhealthy and playing hard sounds very unhealthy. Right. It's like, I worked too hard this week, so now I'm going to get faced this weekend. Very unhealthy at work and very unhealthy on the weekend. Yeah, right? sounds like burnout recipe. Work hard, play hard is a stupid philosophy, right? Work smart, play always, right? Um, and... The point is, is it should, that's why I think it's important for companies to talk about their why, talk about their values, be honest about them, um, because you'll attract people who will more likely want to work within the boundaries that you're setting, right? So for example, people often ask me about Amazon. Isn't Amazon a horrible place to work, right? And I'll say, well, they never lied. This is the expectation. They never lied. Right. They didn't say, oh my God, it's a party here every day. Everybody like, it's just yeah. like unicorns and rainbows. No, you work three hours and you go home. Right. They never lied. They're pretty public about, it's a really demanding job with ridiculous hours. And even the people who love it over the last two years, you know, like it's a really hard place to work. 
But if you like those conditions, then go work there. And here's some benefits and here's that some come benefits. with those conditions. And there's benefits. Or like people talk about Steve Jobs was an Yes. But people who work there, people who worked at Apple under Steve Jobs will all tell you that they were pushed harder than they've ever been pushed in their careers. And the things that they accomplished, they wouldn't have been able to accomplish anywhere else but there. Right. Right? So if you're okay with those boundaries, then go work there. But the point is, is these companies tell you what their expectations are and what it's like to work there up front. And the reason it's important to do that is to attract people who are more likely to want to work within those boundaries. Yes. But it's still an act of co-creation, right? And if you don't like it, then then you should leave. Yes. Right? Now- right. Enter the, a different relationship. Now, if the company lied to you, that's different. Yes. Right? Then you do actually have the right to complain and point fingers. And sometimes, even like at Amazon, it got a little too far. Sure. To reel it back a little bit. Sure, sure, you know? sure. Why do you um, think, I, I don't want to, I mean, I guess I am generalizing a little bit, but obviously this isn't the case for everyone in the younger generation. But why does it seem like there is a conversation happening about the younger generation where there is a, a an entitlement or demand energy towards, okay, this is my first year in this job, you know, out of college, two years out, I don't have all the skills or the experience or the results to show that I'm capable of getting this, but I demand and want all of these things that the younger, the older generation wasn't able to do. Yeah. And then they constantly, not generalizing, but a conversation of them wanting raises within the first month, more, you know, sure, unlimited sure. time off. Sure. This kind of lazy mentality yeah. and entitlement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's multiple factors, of course. <laughs> Parents is one of them. Mm. You know, it's, it's the parenting philosophies of the generation. That was a big part of it. You know, when um, you and I got in trouble at school, um, our parents said, what did you do now? Um, if a lot of people get in trouble at school now, their parents say, what's wrong with your teacher? Right. No, I got suspended. Right. You know, yeah. I was like punished for right. weeks. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, and you know, again, sometimes it is the school and the teacher, but there's bad kids too. Mm -hmm. You know, where kids do stupid sure, things. Sure, sure. No, I, I cheated. So you I know? cheated on a test. So I got, I, got, yeah. I got the consequence. Quite rightfully so. But yeah. it wasn't like, well, you know. They shouldn't punish you. Let's just, you know, do this or make an excuse so, for me. So, so parents is part of it. Um, social media is part of it because we're constantly comparing. My sister had somebody who worked for her back in a previous job and he walked into her office and said, can you give me a promotion? And my sister's like, you haven't worked for her long. Right. And he's like, well, hold on. No, no, no. I, I don't need, you don't have to give me the additional responsibility and I don't even need a salary raise. I just need the new title so I can put it on LinkedIn so my friends can see. Come on. Yeah. Holy cow. After what, like a few months of Whatever working it was. there, yes. But it was really about the the, the display. The yeah. display. So it became one of those metrics like followers or likes, which is how many promotions have you had on LinkedIn? You know? And it's a false sense of accomplishment though. So right? so and it's really funny because there's a corollary here, which is we know that when there is conspicuous displays of wealth. So name brands, when you were your, your little gooch or, you know, or you got, your Chanel, or you got Chanel. your Chanel bag. There's a reason they put the logos on the outside, right? Is because we like that everybody knows, right? And there's data on this, that when you wear your fancy stuff and you put it on and it makes you feel, you actually get, you get shots of, you get bursts of serotonin because it makes you feel proud and like you're, you know, your higher status in, in the community and all of that. That's what conspicuous displays of wealth do. Um, makes us feel good. We also know that when you wear a fake, everybody may think that you got that Chanel bag, but you actually get no serotonin. So if you have a fake, you know, you actually don't get the the feeling of I'm the right because you didn't earn it. You Cause, didn't because it's not real. It's not the real thing. So. I wonder if it seems like the, it seems to make sense that when you have a fake promotion for the title to show your friends, that though your friends may be, may be impressed because they're looking at the logo, that you actually know that it's fake. So you actually don't get a feeling of self-confidence. And I think that this is good. And, and in other words, there's no growth that comes from it. In fact, it might do the opposite. I might make you insecure. Wow. Right. Um, we know this from kids who get medals who come in last, right? Which is great you gave them a medal they know they didn't deserve it actually makes them not feel good interesting right because they didn't deserve it they know that um because they 
and and the kids who did earn it it's devalued because you gave one to somebody else as well mm -hmm. so parenting is part of it social media is part of it um uh but i think the other part of it which is not considered uh by older generations my business partner talks about this all the time which is when i entered the work field when you entered the work field back back in the day we were legit when we came out of college we were legit idiots mm -hmm. <laughs> right we had no clue we thought we, we had knew. no skill set yeah. whatsoever no discernible value whatsoever you know we all started making photocopies right and we had to look up to the people we worked for because they were going to teach us everything that we needed to know and we learned a skill set from working in from the people who we worked for mm -hmm. right that was how it worked yeah you have a young generation now that's graduating high school and college that enters the workforce with a skill set. And sometimes it's a skill set that the older generation doesn't have. Mm. They understand personal branding. They understand social media. They understand how computers work. They photography, understand video photography, editing, yeah. video editing. They understand the algorithms. They can game the algorithms better than anybody, right? The, look at all the, look at Mr. Beast. He's what, 22, 23? Billions of views, right? His numbers are better than every top movie ever. Ever. Yeah. Right? I went to an event once where there were all these like fancy actors and Mr. Beast was there and none of them knew who he was. And and I was looking at and I was like doing the numbers, which is if you took like one of the A-list celebrities and added up the total number of people that have seen all of his movies ever, it doesn't even come close to like one video from Mr. Beast. Crazy. Right? And yet none of them knew who he was. And, uh, and they all think they're hot and like, no, this kid's the hot. Right. right. So I think that's another problem that we're not, it's not a problem, but that's another consideration, which is that 21 year old actually does have a skill set, and they know that that skill set has value. And so they are entering the workforce knowing that they know something that you don't know. And so they're not coming in as total idiots. And they, though there is still the need for them to learn and to, 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 there's the sense that I already know something. And so you should start giving me more upfront. Wow. Right. And so I think it's right for older generations to recognize that they actually know stuff we don't know. And they're actually good at things better than we were when we were their age. Um, and that has value, just not as much value as they may think because there's still a lot more for them to learn. Sure. Or there's the application of that skill set that needs to be honed. Um, or maybe that skill set has no value in this job. Right, <laughs> you should right. get a job to do that. So I, it's, it's, it's... What, is, what is the, I mean, we're generalizing this, but what is the greatest uh, skill that the younger generation has going into the workforce and the thing that will hold them back the most? Oh, well, that's a good question. Um, I think they're probably one and the same, to be honest. I think it's a complete comfort and... and uh, facility with technology integrated into their lives, fully integrated, um, which is a blessing and a curse. It's going to, uh, I'm just a, I'm just a repeating record, which is there's a balance and there's a cost for everything. And the cost for that facility and that ease and that comfort with technology is deep, meaningful relationships. Interesting. Um, because they're on the phone 20 hours a day or, as opposed to connecting in person. Or worse, they think being connected and connecting are the same thing. I had a fight with a 16 year old a couple of years ago that they, her and her friends send voice messages to each other. And I said, why don't you just pick up the phone and call each other? She goes, we are. I'm like, no, you're not. You're sending voice memos to each other. She genuinely believed that that was a conversation, mm. right? It's not a conversation. It's a disjointed. It's listening to my answering machine and then leaving somebody else's message <laughs> on their answering machine. And that's what it is just in real time. It's just quicker. Right. Um, but I think that, and when, when we feel a little lonely or down, because we have such facility with the stuff, we go to the stuff to be a balm for that l feeling of loss or loneliness that we have. It's not that different for any why, why alcoholics drink or, you know, which is alcoholics drink only for a finite number of reasons, which is social stress, career stress, and social stress. It's pretty much it. Um, did I say financial? Um, and you know, when, when, and we see it all the time, right? You see, you know, Brene Brown talks about this as well, which is we've confused 
uh, vulnerability in broadcasting, which is making a video by yourself in your room of you crying because you're depressed or you got broken up with or whatever, you know, and, and you just being vulnerable. And then you have that expression validated by likes and views. That's right? not vulnerability. It's not vulnerability. That's simply broadcasting your emotions by yourself. By the way, you're by yourself in your room with your phone, right? That's literally what's happening. Now I challenge people who do that, go have that exact conversation, say all the same words to a friend in the same room as them. And you'll find that much more difficult. Is it harder to broadcast to a million people your emotions than it is to one person in person? No, it's easier. It's easier to do, to broadcast yeah, it yeah, yeah. than it is to have a conversation For with sure. a friend, a family member, or someone close I, to you. I, I can go on, I can hit play, I can hit record on FaceTime, and I can look in my computer and be like, I'm struggling. I'm really having a hard time. Stop, play. I'm going to do that again. Record. Wow. I'm struggling. I'm really having a hard time. Real talk here, just talking in real talk. <laughs> you know, just speaking my truth here, you know? Um, and I want you guys to know that, you know, I'll get through this. And then analyze it afterwards. And then post it, pick a picture to go on it, you know? Versus going to a friend and sitting across a table from somebody and going, I'm struggling. And I don't know what's going on. That's excruciating. Wow. That's true vulnerability because there is no vulnerability doing it by yourself. Like There's a perception of vulnerability just the same way I can turn on a movie and watch an actor playing vulnerability, right? And I'm like, oh my God, they're so vulnerable. Well, I'm watching the performance of vulnerability. So for me, the viewer... It's real. Right. And for and I have no doubt that the person making the video is feeling something. I, I, I right. get it. But they're creating a piece of art. But they're yeah. but they're but they're not it's not that they're creating a piece of art, it's that they're not the thing that, that will help them, the thing that will help them get over that feeling and feel safe is not the number of likes that validate the expression. The thing that'll make them feel safe is for them to take the have the incredibly uncomfortable, awful conversation with somebody where they say the same things and that person sits there and goes i got you i got you mm. right and like i remember i have a friend who's he's he's an impressive he's an impressive dude and um and i love him to death and i didn't want to show him vulnerability because i am so impressed by him i wanted him to be, him to be impressed Very by interesting. me he's so strong i want him to know that i'm strong right? Um, I don't want him, and it's not because I intellectually understand the importance of vulnerability, but it's still, I want to, I want my friend to like me. I want my, my amazingly impressive friend that I think is super impressive to think I'm impressive too, and I'm on his level. And I remember I was struggling, and I called him up, and I go, I'm not in a good place. And, I, and he was like, what do you got, bud? What do you need? And um, I remember we were, uh, I we were out once and I said to him you know you're one of those friends that I would call in a hard time and he said to me I'd be mad if you didn't and we have this magical relationship no, now where we open cool. up to each other and we open to each other are pretty and it doesn't at all do any damage to what I think about him in fact it makes me think more of him that's beautiful um, the interesting thing not to interrupt you there but the interesting thing that you said intellectually I think all of us think I don't want to I want to be on their level of course. so I want to be strong or make sure that I'm representing myself in a way that is at their level. And if I'm vulnerable or showing that I'm struggling, then will I be less than that? Correct. Why is that when actually vulnerability brings us closer together? Well, it's also a story we say in our own heads, right? Because it turns out he's not all buttoned up. And it turns out he's not got every answer. And it turns out everything he touches doesn't turn to gold. And it turns out he's got insecurities. And it turns out he's got fears. And turns out he's got anger and he's got frustration and he's got all those things too. turns out he's human. Well, yeah. and this is where the relationship became beautiful, which is he is more impressive than me. He's a much more impressive guy than I am. And I love him to death and he loves me to death. Not because we're comparing our resumes. It's because we trust each other and hold space for each other. And I've seen him at his worst and he's seen me at my worst. And that's fine. 
And I think that's what social media doesn't allow. And it's, again, forget about the people who they're broadcasting to. I have absolutely, you've helped me. Seeing this has helped me. I know that when I broadcast things, it helps, uh, it helps yeah. people. I, I know that. Yeah. And, 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 and that has value. Yes. I'm talking about the person who's making the video, who's struggling themselves, how they find safety and salvation. They will not find it in the broadcast. They will at some point have to go to a friend and ask for help. Wow. And they can still make the broadcast to serve others. Yeah. Not anti the broadcast, but that person is kidding themselves if they think that is the way mm. to find peace and calm in a life. Yeah. There's something that I wanted to go back to. I'm loving all this, by the way. Thank you for sharing so openly, um, which is about the breakdown in life. And the breakdown, the scenario, the situation that causes us to either fall apart or come together or start to look differently about our life and ask, what's the point of the direction we're heading? I'm curious in your mind, um, again, there's been a lot that's happened in the last few years, pandemic, war, and AI, which is being talked about more. Obviously, it's been around for a long time, but now it's being talked about Yeah, yeah, about and then it's moving at a pace that's ridiculous, which is very, very scary. Right. I don't mean to diminish it. It yeah, is moving at a pace. fast the, the, You know, when the internet showed up, the adoption for internet was years. Yes. The adoption for most technologies is decades. Mm -hmm. This thing is increasing oh. its potential and its speed in weeks and months. Which it's is, crazy. And w which no, is not giving us time to consider that balanced equation. That's the part I find scary. Yes. Is not the technology, it's the speed of adoption. Right. And uh, the social ripples. And social ripples. Yes. And remember, governments have to adopt it. Mm -hmm. They don't have a choice. Right. Right. So like nuclear weapons, right? When nuclear weapons showed up, governments had to. Whether they wanted to or not was irrelevant. They had to because if the other one does, yes. we don't have a choice. Right. And it's the same thing here. Like all of the defensive and offensive weapons and AI, governments have to, they have no choice. But we actually do have the ability to set pace and we're not. And there is fear of being left out. There's massive FOMO. So one company's investing in it heavenly. The other one's like, we have to invest in it heavenly because they are, so we have to. Right. Right. And so there's FOMO and fear of being left behind. And some of it's true, but not necessarily the pace and, and blindness which we're throwing the technology at our companies and our businesses. And I think history will always repeats itself, which is when you do something blindly and too quickly, at some point it's going to break. Right. Um, right. Um, and so we don't know what or how that looks, what, wh when it's going to happen, but it's probably going to happen. Right. I mean, think, you know, nature abhors imbalance and seeks equilibrium at all times. This is why when this is stock market crash, we call it a correction, mm -hmm. right? Because there is imbalance and it finds correction. Like that's how mother nature works. She always finds balance at some point, right? You don't know when, but it's going to happen. You don't know at some when, point. but it is going to happen. Yeah. Right. And I think that the imbalance that we're creating with the speed of the adoption of the technology that we don't fully understand, the balance is going to happen. Yeah. I don't know how. I don't know what. I don't know what's going to look like. No one can predict it. There's a lot of people trying. And there's no way to slow it down because now the genie's out of the bag. No one's going to be like, you know what? I'll be the one to slow it down. Right. Let's stop this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, government can put some guardrails on. Europe is actually attempting to put some guardrails on, which I think is helpful. Interesting. Yeah. America, not so much. Right. Um, you know, we think guardrails are anti-capitalist, which they're not, they're just guardrails. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, we can debate where the guardrails are, but guardrails are good. Sure, sure, sure. You mentioned early on, I, li I like that you talked about the fear that causes a lot of social ripples with these different things that happen, right? Especially around AI or around pandemics or around war, right? You've mentioned a few of these things. With everything we've seen in the last few years, which one do you think will cause more fear and more emotional reactions or social ripples between another virus or pandemic-like experience war or AI and the acceleration of AI? I think income inequality is bigger than all of them. Which, what, what is that? Income inequality. Income inequality will create more social ripples and fear than these three. Yeah, just look at what's been happening over the past 30, 40 years. The rise of populism, the rise of strongman leaders, mm. the cynicism about democracy. Um, and it's not that democracy or capitalism are bad. It's that 
this version of democracy, this version of capitalism, not democracy, this version of capitalism that we have that was largely engineered in the 80s and 90s by people like Jack Welch and Republican and Democratic presidents at the time um, is woefully imbalanced and um, it is it is um, lopsided. Mm-hmm. You know, the stock market used to be a place that the average working American could share in the wealth of the nation. And now the stock market has become the bastion for the few. Um, you know, um, CEOs who are incentivized by the price of an equity work hard to make other people rich um, and often don't include the workers or worse, use the workers to help balance those books, the, the use of mass layoffs, which was a relatively modern phenomenon, didn't exist in the United States prior to the 1980s. Really? Didn't exist. I mean, there were layoffs, but not to balance the books. They were used for existential reasons. Like we're going bankrupt, we have to do something drastic. Right. Versus, oh, we missed our numbers, you lose your job. Wow. But that didn't exist. And so we have a very woefully uh, a flawed version of capitalism that is not the capitalism that made America great, nor is a capitalism the kind of capitalism that Thomas Jefferson was enamored by, as written by Adam Smith. Um, and I think the that disparity, and we're seeing it play out now in the um, the strikes, mm-hmm. the, the writer's strike and the and the actor strike, and the actor strike um, which is people working hard to make a small group of people very wealthy and being left out. Nobody minds that a CEO is highly paid. The problem is, is that it's the system of how they get paid that you're you're not including and bringing people with you. That's the problem. That you're making money off of their backs without them without them letting feel like they're sharing in the spoils that they help create. Right. That's the problem. And we know how we got here. It's because, again, it goes back to metrics, right? The way we measured money was very easy. This is sort of going off on a tangent, if we really want to talk I about I like it. your tangents, yeah. You know, which is, I used, it's very easy, right? And this has been talked about. This is not, this is not a new idea. Um, um, I would broadcast a TV show and I could count how many people viewed it, right? Ratings. And then... And then I can get picked up for syndication and I can count everything and I can give you a percentage of all the things that I can count, right? Um, Whereas when we went to streaming and everybody, when streaming first showed up, they thought it would be minor. So they didn't, it wasn't built into the contract. Yeah. It was considered an alternative media. Don't worry about it. Yeah. But now when something gets a billion views, um, there's no direct advertising dollars applied to that show and there's no syndication applied to that show. And even though that show may, we can't tell that that's what, why somebody subscribed because the subscription made the money, not the show, even though the show is, gets more views than everybody else. And so, and Netflix and none of the streamers tell you the numbers of the views, which is really a bad idea because it goes back to metrics and numbers, which is if you can count it, you need to share the numbers so that we can establish a value. And if we can establish a value, we can say what it's worth, right? right? So hiding numbers is never a good thing when it comes to um, playing mm-hmm. with people's income. Where do you think capitalism should be, the new definition of capitalism should be then? Well, it's everything that I write about in every single one of my books. The right? infinite game, yeah. The infinite game, leaders eat less and start with why, all are attempting to chip away that, you know, start with why was that companies should be driven by a higher calling and higher purpose, not just not just making money. It's totally anti um, uh, uh, Milton Friedman and Jack Welch. I mean, I hope to undo everything Jack Welch ever did. You know, um, Leaders Eat Last was about taking care of the people in our care. You know, that leadership is not about being in charge, but taking care of those in your charge. And the infinite game is recognizing that this game of business cannot be won, so stop playing it like it's a finite game um, and stop uh, using people as pawns and start being grateful that they're helping you advance something bigger than yourself. And, and I lay it out there, you know, I lay out what the principles of capitalism should be, um, uh, in the chapter where on Milton Friedman, um, I offer an alternative, um, pri- a list of hierarchy and priorities. Can't remember what they are. <laughs> the, I mean, you I mean, I'm hearing you say, go ahead. Yeah. Feel free to share. Chapter five. Uh, what page is it on? Capitalism should advance a cause, mm. 
protect people, and generate profit. In that order. One more time. Advance a, advance a purpose, protect people, generate profit. So the responsibility of business is to use its will and resources to advance a greater cause than itself, protect the people and places in which it operates, and generate more resources so that it can continue doing all those things for as long as possible. An organization can do whatever it likes to build its business so long as it is responsible for the consequences of its actions. That is, for me, what capitalism should be. And we're not seeing that right now. No. It's the opposite order. It's generate profit, you know, advance purpose, purpose on your yeah. website. It's called marketing. And protect people, you know, when it suits us. Interesting. No, nah, no. Nah. Like, version of capitalism we have right now is pretty bastardized. So the, I'm hearing you say the income inequality and where that's heading is a greater fear and risk than another pandemic, AI, and war. The Whenever you have a huge delta between those that have and those that don't have, you have revolution. Wow. But this is happening all over the world, not just in America, right? Yeah, of course. I mean, other countries, it's... There's a rise you know. of populism around the world. There's a rejection of um, democratic values because they've confused democratic values and the version of capitalism we have. They've conflated the two. Right. Um, so what usually happens in a scenario like this and how long does it take for that thing to occur? <laughs> what has history taught us? There's going to be a revolution. Really? Well, Ar around the whole world? Come on. No. I mean... Come on. I mean, January 6th, these are not the sign. I mean, listen to the messaging of the populists. It's the haves versus the have nots. Yeah. You know? And um, the left needs to listen. You know, they're, they're quick to, the left and the right are both qu quick to criticize the, polit the leaders of each other's movements, but they're missing, the, they're not listening to why people are interested in those messages. They both think, both sides think the other side are sheeple. Mm. Both think the other side are blind, deaf, and dumb. And yet neither side is paying attention as to why um, they both have their own um, rabid followings. And the problem is, is most of the country is moderate. Fine. Most of our nation is pretty moderate. Most of our nation is pretty fine. In between. Will, willing to yet. find compromises. Not really, you know reasonable and yet the 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 angry extremes on both sides have seemed to set the tone um they're playing a finite game but but you know i i'm genuinely afraid of of and i don't know how it looks or when it happens or but i'm i think yeah i think when we start ripping when we start accusing each other of being traitors i mean the left and the right literally say call each other traitors or un-american uh, that's not good. That's not good. That's not good. It's not good. I've got a few final questions for you. This has been powerful. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for opening up and sharing. We could go on for hours. Um, I don't know if you remember this. Last time we talked on the show six, seven years ago. Oh, yeah, sure. I remember it intimately. Yeah. <laughs> I referenced this. I can't even remember what I ate yesterday. I, I, re I referenced this part of the conversation I don't remember the whole talk, but I remember asking you one question about self-confidence and self-belief. Because I, at the end of the day, still think that when we as individuals learn to have more self-belief, self-confidence yeah. through actually building it, not a false sense of it, yeah. we can make better decisions, we we create better lives for ourselves and those around us, all these things. Yeah, I agree. And so I think a lot of it comes back to building belief in self and self-worth by overcoming challenging things, by being consistent with your word, all these different things that we talk about. Yeah. And I said, how do we build self-worth if we're really struggling? And you gave me an answer that I think I wrote in my last book even about it, that, at some point. Uh, and I don't know if you remember what you said. What did I say? But you said, um, you know, I would have tried to speak like you. You said, you know, well, interesting thought here. I used to, you know, I used to think that it was like instilling confidence in someone else by like speaking up to them and, and motivating them, you know, telling them you're great and you can do this and coaching them up. 
But I had a friend who just always struggled. They would call me. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A female friend, I think it was. Yeah, they would yeah, call yeah. me, and yeah. I would try to coach them up and say, you got it. You got the skills. Yeah, yeah. You got the you've got the degrees. You've got everything. You can do this. Yeah. And she just couldn't do it. It would, it would last for like two or three days. Yeah, yeah, something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And then eventually she'd come back and doubting herself and insecure, and I can't do this. Yeah. And you were like, huh, am I failing as a motivator or a leader or a coach or something? You know, yeah. you something off on me. And then you said, you know what? I actually, there was something I was struggling with. Yeah that I needed help in in my life. And I actually thought she could be someone that could help me with this thing. Yeah. And I asked her to help coach me or guide me Correct. or something like that. Yeah. And it helped build her confidence by using something and helping me overcome my challenge. Correct. And I thought that was interesting. And I've, I've remembered that and I've referenced that in a lot of different things uh, to inspire others to, to help their friends by coaching them, not trying to motivate them. Or Find, help, if you're struggling with somebody, Go help somebody who's struggling with the same thing. Mm. Yeah. I mean, that's what Alcoholics Anonymous is. You right. know, the first step is admitting you have a problem, but the 12th step, which is the most essential step, is help another alcoholic. Yeah. Um, and so um, if you're struggling with confidence, help somebody else build their confidence. Yeah. If you're struggling with um, finding love, help somebody else find love. If you're struggling to find who you are, help somebody else find who they are. Yeah. And the amazing thing is, is we will solve our own problems by helping others solve, solve the same, solve, yeah, it's beautiful. solve theirs. And it works and it's for real. Yeah. And it's, and by the way, it's because we're social animals and it's, and it's the, it's the fabric of, of humanity. Yeah. Service. Yeah. And there's a few things that we've forgotten in our modern society. We've forgotten about service. You know, I think service is essential and we don't really do it much anymore. And we've forgotten about honor. Mm. You know, honor is not a thing anymore. You know, chivalry is gone. There used to be a time where your word was everything and the reason you did what you said is because if people heard that you didn't have honor, they wouldn't do business with you. Right. They wouldn't do anything with you. Like your word is what you had. And honor is a thing that we've forgotten in our country. So let me give you one example of what honor looked like. Right. So um, um, I'll put it simply. So dishonor is taking advantage of somebody else's pain for personal gain. Honor is putting your selfish interests aside to serve somebody who's in need, right? And so, for example, if you're if the company is struggling and like a whole bunch of people have quit and you're the last person left in your in your department while the company is really struggling, a lot of people use that leverage to ask for a raise because they know that you can't lose me because I'm essential. That's dishonorable. Work hard, help the company figure things out. And then when you're out of the, the hole, then absolutely go back and say, hey, look, I was really yeah. good. I was really, I stuck with you through thick and thin. I know that it was brutal and now I like, it's a raise. Totally fine with this, mm -hmm. right? But taking advantage of someone's pain and misfortune for personal gain, using that as leverage is dishonorable. And so I want to see a, a return to honor where we use, we see with someone's per, pain or struggle as an opportunity to support doesn't mean putting our needs and desires aside. It means putting them aside, mm. you know, temporarily putting them aside. And I just believe in honor. And I, one of the things I love about the military is they still use the term honor. Like somebody can be smart, somebody can be reliable, somebody can be really good at their job, but dishonorable. It has nothing to do with trustworthiness or intelligence or any of those things. It's a, it's a separate thing that we don't talk about. Mm. And I, I love the military. Like people like, you know, introductions will get made and somebody say, you got to meet this guy, Simon. And he's, I'm like a good guy. They're like, yep, honorable. I'm like, yep, I'll meet him. Wow. What's the difference between honorable and trustworthy? Um, trustworthy simply means I'm, I'm going to say what I'm going to do. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll do what I say. So like somebody who, the, they're a good employee. They're, they're not lying. They're not yeah. lying. Yeah. They're not liars. They're just. They could be dishonorable. Sure. Sure. You're not a liar. You're like, I don't think you're a liar when like it's, um, it, it, I mean, you take it into a personal, like when somebody's. Like let's go, somebody's going through like serious financial times and there's this, say whatever you want. There's a, a thing that you've always coveted that they have. And when they're going through really tough times is the time you lean and be like, I'll give you a thousand bucks for that. Mm, right. That's dishonorable. Right. It's taking advantage. It's taking advantage yeah, yeah. of somebody's pain or misfortune for personal gain. That is dishonorable. And I believe in honor. I believe in honor. And now what's the difference between someone saying... Hey, I'm in a tough spot and I'm willing to sell this at a discount. That's different. That's different. That's them presenting it to you. That's not you taking advantage. Right. That's not you seeing 
it's not you seeing a point of leverage, mm-hmm. right? Right. Powerful. It's not. It's not you saying I've got all the cards. Right. And so, to me, honor is important. Honor. I expect honor from the folks on my team. I expect honors from the people I work with, from the the, the vendors we use. You know. Mm-hmm. And I'd rather suffer in the short term than work with somebody who is dishonorable. That's beautiful. I love that. And what is something you've you've learned or maybe observed in the last? I, I, I keep thinking it's five, six years. I don't know when our last conversation was, but in the last six years on how we can better improve our self-worth and our belief in selves with everything that has occurred in in the world and in life in these last six years. What's something else you've observed through hard times, through confusion, through- There's, noth- there's nothing new. It's just been reinforced. Yeah. Which is double down on relationship. Mm-hmm. Double down on friendship. Yeah. You know, we talk about how to measure a, a, a day on productivity. It's like, you got a lot done. Phew, you got a lot done, right? Did you call anybody today and just tell them you love them? Mm -hmm. Like I'll sometimes call a friend and be like, hey, I just want to call you and tell you I really, really like you and value that you're in my life. In fact, on my drive here, as I was driving here, I took the time in the car to call a friend and say, I just wanted to call you and tell you how much I value our friendship and want you to know that I will do everything to protect this friendship for the rest of my life. And, And I went through all the reasons why this friendship was important to me and why I'll fight for it. And I just, there was nothing that I wanted. I just wanted them to know. Mm. That's all. It's hard to have a bad day when we do that. So, so, you know, if all I did was come on a podcast and do that. Pretty good day. It's a good day. That's a pretty good day. So, so I think, I think, you know, I think we have to start weighing the value of a day based on, so there's this thing that I did for a while. I'm, I, my ADHD prevents me from doing anything for a long period of time. <laughs> like I come up with a system and do it really well for a while. And then, I, then it comes back. They cycle around. Mm-hmm. But I had a fish bowl. I had two fish bowls uh, in my bedroom. And we can calculate how long we have to live. Like we know the average American male living in this part of the world will live to about this age. Right? We, that's, and I, so we, you and I can calculate statistically how many weeks we have left to live. Right? So what I did was I did that calculation and I put one marble for every week. Actually, I can't remember if I did one marble. I started with one marble for every day, believe it or not. But I bought all these marbles, one marble for every day that represented how many days I have left statistically on the planet Earth. And then had an empty fishbowl next to it. And I would hold up one marble at the end of the day and say, did I live a day worth living? And if the answer was yes, I put it in the fishbowl. If the answer was no, I threw it in the garbage. I wasted a day. Wow. And I made it and by the way, the standard was my, whatever I wanted it to be. The standard was my own. So if I felt today was a good day, today was an inspiring day, I did something to inspire someone. And I didn't trick myself and be like, oh, well, you know, like I was honest with myself. And the goal was, and it was just a nice little reminder that every day I had to do something for somebody. That was my standard, that I had to do something for someone every day. And so I literally would hold up the marble, think about the day, think about the week, and then put it in or I wouldn't. I didn't throw away many because when you start, now I have a metric. You're intentional, yeah. I ma- but I made, I made my day tangible. My day is an intangible thing until it becomes a marble. Interesting. Now my day was tangibilized. Yeah, that's and a great. And now it became a thing. I like that system. Are you doing that again? Yeah, it'll come up. These fools, <laughs> yeah, like cycles. everything in my life, they cycle yeah, yeah. through. Yeah. Um, this is a question I asked you before <laughs> that is called the three truths. So imagine a hypothetical scenario. It is that last day on earth yeah. for you. And you get to live as long as you want, extend your life as long as you want and create and do all the things you want to do. Yeah. Uh, but for whatever reason, it's the last day and you've accomplished everything or not and just live beautiful days without accomplishments. But you can't take, uh, or, or excuse me, everything you've created has to go with you. This conversation, gone. Your books, they're gone. It's on to another world or somewhere else. But they're not in this world. Everything you've ever said or done, we don't have access to anymore. But you get to leave behind three lessons. I call it the three truths. Three things that you know from your experiences are true to you that you would want to leave behind as lessons to the world. What would be those three truths for you? Um, uh, really love the people who love you. Really love them. Um, learn all the human skills that you need to be a good human being. Um, 
because being human is hard. And um, and have as much fun as possible. And what I mean by having much fun as possible doesn't mean playing video games and taking vacations every moment, but make jokes, make joke, have a sense of humor. Like in in a, you can't you can't be angry and laugh at the same time. You know, Stephen Colbert talks about this. You know, you can't. Like, there's something magical in a high stress situation as a joke, and you know whether it's gallows humor or whether it's you find the absurdity in something. You know, it's like, just make sure to maintain your sense of humor. Yeah. So love those who love you desperately. Learn the human skills to be a great human being and make sure that you appreciate that life really is fun. Over a thousand conversations, I don't think I've heard them in that, in that way, those three truths. I've asked it every time and I didn't expect that from you. So that was really beautiful. I appreciate you sharing those three. Um, I want to acknowledge you, Simon, for your constant personal growth. No, oh, thank you. Your constant personal growth. Uh, you know, I've I've watched you for years. You know, be a phenom on the internet with TED Talk and books and all. You know, all the things and accolades. Uh, you know, I've been at events with you. I've had you on the show. We know a lot of the same people, and you know. Uh, but I really love just watching you personally grow as a human being. Speak about these things, loving people desperately. Um, having as much fun as possible, you know, being someone who's looked at as an intellectual, uh, and extremely smart talking about humor and fun is awesome for me to hear and, uh, being the best human you can be knowing that this is a challenging existence or it can be unless you choose to learn skills and overcome it. So I'm really acknowledging for your personal growth oh, and, thank you. and, uh, hope now that we're more neighbors, I'll, I'll run into you more frequently yeah. And uh, get to give you more hugs. So I really acknowledge you for thank you everything, and I also acknowledge you for this, which I think is interesting. Asked you before we came on here today. I acknowledge you for not having something to be productive in right now. Of course, you've got you know book and your podcast and you know content that you're creating, but you're not like I'm working on this massive project and I've got to do it. I've got this deadline and it's got to be this way. You're like, yeah, I'm allowing ideas to come to me. I'm allowing things to form. I'm building deeper relationships. I'm connecting with my my girlfriend. I'm doing these things. I acknowledge you for that because I think it's hard at times to allow ourselves to not be overly productive and always creating something and always trying to strive to be on top. So I acknowledge you for being in that space. And I think it's a beautiful thing too. Well, that's very nice of you. Um, um, I think it's important to know who you work for, right? So I would only have stress to come up to write another book if I believed that I worked for my publisher, but I don't. And I would only have stress about the amount of content creation I have to produce if I believed I worked for the algorithm, but I don't. Um, I work, I work for the people who share this world with me. I work for my friends. I work for my family. I work for the people who see the world the way I see it. And I live, try, I've worked very hard to live a life of service. And, you know, the way I manage my social media is I say something that I think um, is additive. I never pile on because what the, the, there's no point. I, I, I'm very prescriptive that I will speak if I have something that I believe is additive. And, um, and if I have nothing to say and if I have nothing to write, then I'm going to say nothing and I'm going to write nothing. Um, and... I think you have to know who your customer is and then be fiercely customer oriented. And I use the word customer in quotes. Like if you're a parent, you know, your kids are your customer, you know, if you're a teacher, your students are your customer, you know, if you're a nurse, your patients are your customer. And I think you have to be fiercely, fiercely customer focused. And, um, um, in my, in my chosen line of work, my customer is the army who chooses to stand shoulder to shoulder with me to build the world that we imagine. Wow. A world in which people wake up every single morning inspired, feel safe wherever they are, and end the day fulfilled by the work that they do. Mm. Yeah. I love it, man. Uh, I want everyone to support you, and you've got a number of great books. The Infinite Game is one that I think the themes have been spoken about throughout here over and over again of how we can start reimagining our own personal lives or career industries, you know, everything, the world. So I want people to get this, uh, start with why obviously as a, as a phenom that everyone should have as well, if they haven't got it, you're 
simonsinek.com has got all your content and information. I love your Instagram and your LinkedIn is, is massive as well. If you guys are over there, it's YouTube. all focused on human skills. Exactly. That's what it is. So if you want to develop better human skills, follow wherever you're on social media. And all um, the places, all the, all the things, all the things, the podcast, bit of optimism and check it out there if you want to go deeper as well. But how else can we be of service to you today? Do the things like the, 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 the being of service to me is to, I'm, I'm, I'm one person who puts out a vision of the world and some tools to help build it. But until leaders lead with those tools, until we, and by leader, I don't mean those in charge. I mean, those who choose to take on the awesome responsibility to see those around us rise, which can happen at any level inside an organization or in our society. And what I need people to do is do it because I, I'm, my work is intangible and I need people to make it tangible. Yeah. Final question. Yep. What's your definition of greatness? Um, I think it's everything we've talked about. My definition of greatness is, is, is living a life of service. And, you know, the people that I think are great devoted themselves to the lives of others. I'm, I'm a great believer that for if a message has value, it has to be um, simple, understandable, and repeatable. Yeah. Right? Because if you can make it simple, that means somebody else can understand it. Mm -hmm. And if somebody else can understand it, that means they can repeat it without you there and without reading the words from a book. So my goal 